Uh, and, and, that, and, I'm, and I'm, try, I'm not trying to disagree with you except to say this is, I mean, I, I have certainties about the fact that we are thawing. And I have certainties about the fact that this is going to be global and it's going to be information. And I, and I have concluded, one of my conclusions after 20 years of thinking about it, is that American civilization will turn out to be the highest way of organizing humans to liberate the maximum amount of energy. So you have the maximum creativity. So I'm, I'm now sort of convinced that at that level I know where we're going. I can't tell you many of the details. I can't tell you that we'll get to a, not just a hard or soft boiled egg, I can't tell you what it will be like. I'm still in the observation phase of, gee, the water is boiling, isn't it? And that is the fifth time we've learned that. And just seeing how it, how it plays out. But I think it's just as frustrating for the people that's here to be, keep being in a society that's so frozen. Because I have, sure. for, for example, I have a daughter, or my three children are Montessori trained. <laughs> and they are, it's a very, it's more of a dialogue type learning situation. And they go to age, I mean, grade six, and then they're all of a sudden they're forced back into this. Sure. And all of a sudden, this system over here is telling them, I'm the teacher, <coughs> don't right. interrupt my class. Right. So and, they, and, and, of just, and of course you're. I think they're more this is, here, here than they are and, there. And, and in a sense, this is, this is one of the very interesting things we're going through right now. This is the first great crisis. The first great crisis is not here. The first great crisis is, for example, the power of obsolete education systems to coerce taxpayer money to continue to fail. I mean, it is astonishing the amount of money we spend on systems that are totally failing. The DC schools spend $9,600 per child. What's the national average? Give us a benchmark. Much lower than that, about $4,400, $4,500. $4, For $9,600 per child, you can go to an elite private school. Is that per year? Per yeah. year. Per year. <coughs> that means a class of 20 is $192,000 in the room. I mean, one of the studies I want to get done is, is, is to say, if we just said to a teacher, here is $192,000, rent a room, buy the books, and feed them lunch, you get to keep the rest. Teachers' pay would change radically overnight. I mean, just think about that. Literally, it's, I, mean, I, had, I had these numbers checked because I, because I knew it was going to be amazing. $96,000. $100. And that's not the highest. The highest may well be in Newark, which is, I think, like 10500 I mean, and you're not getting, you're getting about $1,200 worth of learning. And yet, we have been convinced by this system that the only answer is, why aren't you spending more? When I mean, what you need to do is dissolve it. Lawyers are the same way, as you're going to see next week. I mean, we accept levels of litigation that are, that are insane. Why do we do it? Because, it, because at the high water mark of the industrial era, it's what the lawyers could get through because guess who dominated the legislatures? Okay, so you go through a whole series of these things. Now, I mean, on the other hand, you're going to threaten people. And there's no question in my mind that, that the idea of self-diagnosis will be bitterly resented and will absolutely happen. Just as self-learning will happen. I mean, you're seeing it with home, with home learning. I mean, nobody's yet figured out homeschooling is part of the third wave. I mean, if you can get the best computer software, the best textbooks, the best videotape, and your parents are willing to invest in your learning, and it turns out, what was the number of, of 15 out of the 17 top scorers on the SAT were homeschooled? Some, some number like that I saw the other day that I don't, you know, the, the media that normally takes this off, they should check it uh, before they take it out of my class. But there is some number that's amazing about the number of homeschoolers that are now doing very, very well. Well, why is that? Part of it's because it's the emerging third wave environment. I mean, I mean the, the, the embedded base of learning is so enormous, you take your child to a great museum. Then you take them over here to a great zoo. Then you take them down and they get to see a factory. <coughs> then they get to read about it. Then they get to watch the videotape. Then they get to use the, the PC at home and use the best software in the world. And you're personally nurturing and interacting with them. Now, I'm not arguing for homeschooling. I didn't make, my, my children and my wife and I are all products of traditional regular public schools. But I am saying that's a characteristic that is bubbling here that is telling us something. And for 9,600 bucks, you can do a lot of homeschooling. Have there been any returns on that? I believe it was Boston that uh, opted, you know, in a certain community to uh, give the parents of students the money that they were spending on the children. No, I don't think it's in Boston. No, there, there is in Milwaukee, where, where, where again, where again, Polly Williams, a black welfare mother, 
who had been Jesse Jackson's co-chairman of state legislator, or created vouchers for the inner city. Tremendously bitter fight. And the Republicans made her the chairman or chairwoman of the uh, education committee in the legislature. But what you, what you get right now is from <coughs> public managed public schools to corporate managed public schools, the, the Baltimore experiment or the Hartford experiment. I think that's only a very tiny step. I mean, I think there, there's something happening here for doctors, lawyers, and educators that will dissolve this system. You're going to see the same thing in the news media. I mean, every person is going to become a reporter. And you just have, a, you have an explosion of, you know, why don't you contribute to your own newspaper? The newspaper will be electronic. And, and you see some of it, you see it with auto accidents, don't you? I mean, somebody calls in, they got, you know, they're on the, at least in Atlanta, they're on the Bell South mobile phone. They get to call, you know, WSB for free, and they go, wow, I am right here, and there was a big tanker truck problem right here. And they're now the live, on the spot volunteer reporter for the opening two minutes. And does, doesn't that sort of fit what you hear? Or well, you get traffic updates from the 37,000 people who call us. <laughs> you know, I'm now, and, and it's interesting because what you're getting is a total redefinition of what it means to be a reporter. You still have professional reporters, but you're now getting all sorts of people who are random. And when we shot down the Airbus over the Persian Gulf, there was, in fact, a video camera in a boat just held by an amateur. They filmed the plane crashing. Well, they immediately sold it, probably to CNN. That person was, for that moment, a temporary reporter, weren't they? Similarly, you're going to have a lot of self-law. You're going to have a lot of self-health. You're going to have, a, you know, where, where you, you get up in the morning and you sit in an armchair or something and you, uh, it says to you, you, your cardiovascular is not good enough, go exercise a little bit more, add, you know, add a half mile to your run or add 10 laps to your swim or you know, go do Stairmaster longer. We're talking about change. I guess it can be argued that we're change, change is inevitable and change is, is constant. But why are we so resistant to change? Because you want certainty. Humans operate <coughs> best when they're secure. So you, you spend your lifetime trying to find out what can I do. I mean, I, I, I feel this way. I'm a very public figure, as you all know. I hate arriving late. I got into some kind of a goof up the other day. Well, I, National Prayer Breakfast. I arrived late because of some, something else we had to do. And here's this huge crowd. And I was going to have to walk in late. I literally, for a half second, thought about leaving. Just because I hate walking in and being embarrassed. So people have a very high propensity to be insecure. And you, you, know, you, you say, you know, what do you mean I have to learn a new career? Or what do you mean we just changed power companies and now they're billing differently? Or I'm going to change to a new cable system and I can't find my favorite show? Or they no longer do checkbooks the way they used to. And now, I, you know, I mean, anything which makes us insecure goes at this core notion, which is we want to build boundaries around us that are stable so that we know what we can do and have a sense of certainty. It's very human. And it goes back to, to chimpanzee politics and to, to uh, Franz de Waal's work on primates. I mean, you know, that, that, that people want orderly, structured environments in which they have what Yankelovich called a giving and getting contract. I'll do my share, and now you owe me. That's why when you run into the steel worker, who basically thought, if I, if I was a good steel worker for 20 years, you're not allowed to close the factory. You can't make me learn a new career. And what we're describing here is a much, much more decentralized society. I, I, I told uh, Marvin Schuckman that, that, that he ought to change the title of his book from, from uh, Working Without a Net to Building Your Own Net. So. We will pick all of this up and go into the third wave and the world market and creating, next American, creating American jobs. And for that, we're going to ask you to look at Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, chapters 1, 2, 9, and 12.